Have you ever been so tired that you couldn't sleep and you wanted to make a YouTube video? I have, and this is the result. <laughs> Fabrice! So I want to start off by saying it's been a while since I've actually made a video, and that's because of reasons. Today I thought I'd talk about something slightly interesting, uh, a guy by the name of Stephen Hawking. I want to start off by saying that I'm not actually like a Stephen Hawking uh, trivia guy, and really just um, the information in this video has been amassed on a coffee-fueled night of just I couldn't sleep, so I guess we'll just deal with that. <laughs> um, so to start off, if you don't know who Stephen Hawking is, he's probably one of the greatest minds to have ever walked. Okay, so he hasn't. Uh, uh, he, he walked at one point. We'll just do that again. So if you don't know who Stephen Hawking was, is he's a f uh, famous physicist. At the age of 21, he was diagnosed with motor neuron disease, and was given two years to live. So basically, he was unable to control his muscles and it caused him to be unable to walk and eventually not able to talk. And this was during his PhD, well actually it was during his undergrad when he was diagnosed. So this diagnosis came at a very unfortunate time, finals week. Uh, no, actually it probably wasn't finals week, but um, knowing how timing works for students, it very well was time finals week. So moving on, anyways. Stephen Hawking had a short period of depression after he'd found this out. Could you blame him? <laughs> he wasn't even done with his undergrad, and, like, he was given an expiration date. I mean, I couldn't imagine that. That's crazy, right? Well, luckily for everybody involved, he continued his studies, um, and he went on to earn his PhD, publishing his thesis in On the Ides of March in 1966. So when I read that, I was like, oh my god, he died on the same day that he published his thesis, and then I realized, no, that was actually March... 14th, which was Pi Day, um, but I seem to recall that he passed away on March 13th, and I'm not sure if, like, I mean, everywhere you read says March 14th. I don't know if that's true or not, because I remember when he had passed away, I thought of it, and I was like, it, it would be, I mean, it would be amazing if he died um, on March 14th, because of Pi Day, and that's, you know, Einstein's birthday. <laughs> But I, I don't know. I, right now, it's everywhere it says he passed away on March 14th. I think it's March 13th. I don't know. If if you know, maybe leave it in the comments, I guess. I'm not sure what what the actual day is anymore because, I, I mean, I was almost certain that it was not March 14th. Like, I knew it was close to it, and I remember thinking it would be great if it was. I mean, like I said, it would be great. Yeah, I wish somebody died on a day. Yeah, that would. it's a bit strange to think. But, I mean, I feel like that's what everybody's doing. Like, they're wishing that he had passed away on March 14th instead. So they're just kind of like, yeah, that's when he died. I'm not sure. So anyways, I've diverged a bit from what I was trying to talk about. And I stumbled across an article that talked about how Stephen Hawking had made a couple bets in his life, or a couple wagers that uh, were counter to what you would think that he would... I mean, being one of the smartest people in the world, he gambled against some, some pretty well-established, pretty basically accepted theories before they were tested and yeah so uh, this goes this article goes on to explain a bunch of different things and I swear it ties into aliens right it, it gets there eventually but m moving past that so this article mentioned that Stephen Hawking had made a couple bets in his life okay so the first bet he this article mentions that he made was in December of 1974 this is after he published his thesis this is well into his being a doctor, where Stephen Hawking spent a little bit of time, a small amount, looking into black holes. And I would, many would argue that most, much of his research up until that point was black holes. So the first wager that the article mentions Stephen Hawking had made was that he was at a conference? Somehow we met up with Kip Thorne at Caltech University, and it was at this conference or this meeting that he made a, a wager with Kip Thorne that there's this Cygnus X1. It's a massive X-ray source, and back in back then they didn't know what it was. These two bet made a wager that, well, Stephen Hawking took the side of, I don't think it's a black hole. And if, if it's not a black hole, you, Kip Thorne, have to buy me four years of private eye. Under a uh, Google description, it's a British fortnightly satirical and current affairs news magazine. Okay, so needless to say, Hawking just wanted to get his Fortnite on. Really, it's just, that's what it is. 
But no, in all actuality, the article states that Hawking claimed that it was a form of insurance, so basically uh, a collateral <laughs> um, bet. Um, a bit of a win-win situation, you see. So Cygnus X1 was expected, I, more or less, to be a black hole, and I think one of the reasons that Stephen Hawking made the bet was that if Cygnus X1 didn't turn out to be a black hole, that would disprove a lot of what uh, Stephen Hawking had been working on. So, as a measure of just kind of like insurance, right? <laughs> as, he, as he claims it, like if, if, I, if I'm wrong, at least I got four years of a private eye magazine, at least I got, you know, four years of Fortnite. Anyway, so I keep getting distracted. Eventually it comes to aliens, I promise. The aliens are coming. And the second bet that the article mentions is that uh, Stephen Hawking was at conference again, I believe. I'm, I'm assuming that these are conferences where they're meeting up, because where else do, you know, famous scientists meet up at conferences? Obviously, right? It ends up being Stephen Hawking meets up with Gordon Cain of you know, the University of Michigan, and, is that right, Michigan? Yeah, okay. And they made a wager about the Higgs boson, and Stephen Hawking took the side of, well, I don't think it exists. And so they bet $100 on it, and eventually when the the Higgs boson was confirmed. Um, Stephen Hawking praised, you know, Higgs and said, you know, great, but I lost a bet. Now, the reason that the article brings those cases up, I believe, is that it like takes away from his credibility. Like he's been wrong, so he could be wrong about this too. And it's kind of like, it, it feels weird. It feels like it's an attempt to uh, like make Hawking's predictions a little less reasonable or feel a little less threatening to people because one of the uh, things that Hawking dove into was well you know there's a possibility of alien life and alien life if it comes could be hostile and I think some articles actually say that like Stephen Hawking believed that they would be hostile I don't know if that's true or not but he definitely Stephen Hawking was definitely like an advocate that they could be so this brings me to the alien bit of the video right I really hope this is recording. I, I've turned the I've turned the mic on, but I haven't checked the audio settings. Uh, we'll see. I'll just finish, I'll just keep going anyway. So this brings me to the next part where I talk about the aliens and why I don't think that I that we have to worry to such a degree about that happening, right? About a, an alien race discovering that we're here and then coming to attack us. There's there's a few reasons why I think that's the case, and like I mean honestly like. Why would anybody want sloppy seconds on this earth right now? Like, we can barely st survive on it as it is. I mean, like, have you seen the issues with climate change lately? Okay, so in order for, like, aliens to actually visit us, for starters, right, they have to know that we're here. In order for that to happen, God, Stimp, you stink. Your butt stinks. <sighs> Fabrice! I feel bad. I feel like Stimpy understood what I said, and he was like, oh, I don't mean to smell bad, and he started covering his poop. So, anyways, poop stories. <sighs> so, I don't remember where it was. Okay, uh, let's say, okay. Uh, so, in order for alien life to visit us, they have to, like, know that we're here. In order for them to know that we're here, we have to, they have to detect us, right? Basically. So, the problem that I have with the probability of, like, aliens coming here and destroying us because they're angry is just the scale of the universe, basically, like, just how massive the universe is and just how unlikely it is. So I want to talk about the Drake equation. For those who are unfamiliar with it, what the Drake equation is, it's an equation with variables and two equal parameters aimed at finding like the total number of stars, uh, star systems that have intelligent life. So basically one of the parameters is the probability that a intelligent life exists on a given planet. And that's basically 1.7 times 10 to the minus 11, or, or basically 1 in 100 billion. So if we go with that and basically use a completely flawed version of st statistics, so the Milky Way is said to be about 250 plus or minus 150 billion stars. Being as generous as we possibly can, let's say it has 400 billion stars in it, right? That then leaves us with an expected four planets to contain intelligent life. Okay, so let's think about that. Four planets capable of having life with any possible interest of exploring other planets that's for resources in an entire galaxy of 400 billion stars that's crazy to think that they would be interested in finding us i mean like they they might be right i i could see the the desire to anyways that's a different thing so moving on 400 four 
hundred billion stars, four sources of intent, intel, oh my god, that's hard to say, four sources of intelligent life. Wow. Why do I mention all of this, right? Let's say that alien life only exists in the local vicinity, basically. If it was capable of, you know, exploring other star systems, right, it would probably explore a region contained in a, a small bubble, right? Small region. There's ways that you could say that it would be bigger than that, but for the sake of the argument, they're, they're kind of contained to their local region. Okay, cool. So we got that. And I would, I would say it's a bit of a stretch to even think that they got off the planet. Mm -hmm. Anyways, another divergence. So let's start with our basic assumptions. Four stars, basically four sources of intelligent life in 400 billion stars, and that they would have to have detected us. Okay, so how are they going to detect us? Well, that's where it gets a bit complicated, but basically our understanding of physics, like, can only travel so fast in the universe, basically, you know, the speed of light, right? That's the, you know, universal speed limit. So it might come to a surprise to you, it might not, that all of our, like, communications, m much of our communication is based on, like, radio waves, uh, microwaves, different sources like that. Those are all light sources. Uh, we don't see them because they're not visible light, but Right, there's a spectrum. So in our current understanding, well, at least my understanding, there might be people that understand more than this and that that's fine too. Right, so okay, in my understanding, the only way for alien life to detect us is to pick up on those uh, radio frequencies, the microwave transmissions, anything that we've sent out. So basically, we have only been doing like radio transmissions and, and basically communicating through light for like 70 years now. So that would mean that we have a range of 70 light years for them to have heard us, and that's basically just the very beginning of our broadcast. So basically at the edge of the 70 light year bubble, they would basically just be starting to pick up what we were transmitting. They were just starting to pick up what we were laying down, if you know what I mean, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so nerd, get to the point. Again, blah, 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 whatever, what are you trying to say? Okay. So let's be generous and say that we've been doing it for 100 years. We've been uh, transmitting for 100 light years. And that's be mainly because Google has a good estimate <laughs> of 100 light years versus, I, I couldn't find 7, 8, so we're going to just round it up to 100 but for, for simplicity's sake in the fact that fact checking is hard. Okay, so in a 100 light year radius, basically all around us, in, in that distance, right, there's said to be about 76 stars. 76 stars and 4 billion with four, four possible uh, intelligent life forms. Okay, and that's just to detect us. That's just to find out that we're here. That, that 76 light year bubble is so tiny in comparison to the rest of the Milky Way. So like, look at it. It's just so small. There's nothing, that's nothing in comparison. And if we were to place random dots throughout this Milky Way and say this is where they, the life is, what are the chances that they're going to land in that bubble? And then what are the chances that they're going to be able to like travel to us? So we're finally getting somewhere. We have four systems of intelligent life, okay? 400 billion stars, and one of them can barely maintain the existence of their, their planet anyway, and a, and a range of about 76 stars that, in our local bubble of like what, we can, what we've broadcast to. That's 76 stars that could have heard our light, I guess. That's a one way to describe it. They heard our light. Weird. Anyway, the chances of an intelligent alien species, based on the Drake equation, coming from somewhere in our galaxy, being in that bubble is nearly zero. It's like so close to zero that you can almost discount it, right? Chances are real low. I mean, not as low as some thermodynamic, you know, <laughs> you're not going to spontaneously combust kind of things, but it's still real low that something like that would happen, okay? So, even then, assuming, okay, let's say they got to us, it would take them a maximum of 100 years to get here because that's what the bubble, what, what the size of the bubble that we're talking about is. And, that, and that's, it's a maximum, but really that's kind of like a minimum even because that doesn't make any sense with the Okay, so let me explain. The maximum time frame that, that all of a sudden they hear us, okay, 100 light years away. That, the maximum time is 100 light years. But really, like, that's, that's like a minimum on the scale of how fast they could travel. Now, if they're 
if they're interstellar, if they're traveling between stars, they could be moving some fraction of the speed of light. But then, that just means that, okay, let's say if they're moving at point 0.2c, it's going to take them, at 100 light years, uh, 500 years to get here. If they were traveling at the speed of light, they would get here in 100 years. I guess that's entirely possible. There is ways to travel faster than... Uh, well, there's theoretical ways to travel faster than light, with like a warp drive. That's an interesting topic all on its own. Warp drives are crazy. Traveling faster than the speed of light and like in a frame... Wow, my brain just blew up thinking about it. Warp drives are crazy. But theoretically possible, I guess. Hmm. Divergence. Warp drives, you would need like negative energy or negative mass to, to run, basically. And I don't know how you would do that. Not that you couldn't. I mean, if you were an alien life form that was intelligent enough, you could probably figure it out. Um, we're working on it now, so it could be possible. I just don't know how you would manage to get, like, basically, in order to... No. <laughs> Maybe I'll save it for another video. It's a long story. Warp drives are weird. Okay, so let's say for the sake of argument, uh, an alien species was able to master warp drive. They literally can contain negative mass or negative energy somehow and travel with it. Something tells me that single planet system where only one, si one planet is in the habitable zone, only one planet is here that you can live in. Maybe Mars you could consider to li be livable, but no. I guess what I'm getting at is that a, a alien species having the ability to warp drive and go faster than the speed of light, they're not going to necessarily think of us as a resource, right? The universe is huge and we have like no detection of any other life out there. So I don't think that the galaxy, the Milky Way, has been exhausted of resources that an alien life form that was capable of interstellar travel, which would mean uh, if at, at any rate of speed, at any like possible, like at, even at the speed of light, if you're traveling at the speed of light, you don't need to come to Earth to destroy it, to find a new planet to live on. There are so many other planets out there, right? It's just the scale of the universe is immense, right? Let's see, what am I going on about? So, long story short, this is going on super long. I'm probably going to end it soon. I, I don't think that any alien life form that's kind of come here is going to try and, like, harm us. It's you take our resources. So, I, I just don't think that there's an alien life form that would take the time to come here to destroy us because they wanted our planet for resources. I mean, that just doesn't seem like a very efficient form of spending your time if if you were after resources, which is one of Stephen Hawking's arguments, was that, oh, alien life forms would be after Earth because they wanted to take it over. There's so many other planets that have resources that they would use. And this is all, all going off of the fact that we might ha possibly have four other life forms. We might have none. We might be the only ones. It does. It's so weird to think that they would come here and be like, ah, and eat us and destroy us. You might, it's weird. I don't know. I don't think that it's a, it's a huge issue if they were to exist anyway. So, so anyways, this has gone on long enough. It's going to be a nightmare to edit. You're welcome, future me. So in summary, Stephen Hawking, Dr. Stephen Hawking suggests that alien life could be hostile towards us. I disagree. I don't think that they would have any reason to come here and take over if they wanted our resources. Uh, maybe maybe they're just naturally aggressive. You could make that argument. I agree they wouldn't be able to find us, really. It's just such a small of a bubble that we've been, you know, whoa, we're here. That's such a small bubble. And on top of that, like, as, as you get far away from a star, like, that's a bright source, right? We're so close to another light source with all sorts of radiation in its spectrum, and I don't, I, I would argue that our radio frequencies aren't as bright as the sun's radio frequencies, right? Our, our x-rays, our microwaves, all the stuff that we're emitting here from Earth is like pales in comparison to what the sun's doing. So I, even if they were to do detect and manage to like pick, 
maybe they heard a blip. Maybe they heard a blip in our, in, in by our sun. There's a blip, blip. Oh, that sounded like aliens. <laughs> I don't know. Um, in short, because I'm going on forever, if they were able to detect us, no. In short, they wouldn't be able to detect us. That's, it's just not, I don't think that's likely. Because Massive Sun, which is a light source in all of the, in the whole spectrum, huge ma mass. So no, I don't, I don't believe that, I don't buy it. Our sun is a massive light source in all visible ultraviolet radio frequencies, all that stuff. We, <laughs> the noise that we're producing is wiped out by just the sheer size of the sun. More than likely, I would have to argue. It's not likely that they'll, they would detect us. Okay. I'm sure you have your own opinions. If you feel like I missed something, feel free to leave a discussion in the comments about it. Uh, I mean, there, there are definitely arguments you can make against me, and that's perfectly fine. I'd be more than happy to hear what you have to say about it. Whatever you want to say, I would I would actually really be interested in seeing what you guys have to say about it because it's kind of an interesting topic. And if you liked it, I spent a lot of time writing this up. Like I said, I wrote it up at the, in the middle of the night uh, on a coffee-fueled binge of just boredom and inability to sleep. So anyways, if you liked it, feel free to like it, subscribe it, comment it, share it, eat it. Uh, lick it. I don't know. Whatever you want to do. Uh, anyways, I'm, on that note, I'm out of here. Stay nerdy, and I guess I'll see you in the next one. Febreze!